Uh, my name is Arian Ravenbach. As Paul mentioned, uh, described in our organizational, in the organization piece you just heard, I'm in that records management policy box that's sort of off to the left. That was off to the left. Um, I'm on the team that issues records management policy and guidance. The two bulletins that we put out last year, the bulletin on cloud computing and the bulletin on social media, were sort of the the genesis of why we thought we would have a panel here at RACO uh, about those those two things. Um, the, I'm not going to read the, the speaker biographies because you've got those in your packets. And this panel is entitled, How Can Records Man Managers Keep Up With Social Media? I'll turn the podium now over to uh, Pat Franks, who will get us started. Good morning, everyone. I'm pleased to be here. I'm your only speaker. I think that doesn't work for the federal government. I not sure if that's good or bad, but I was in a very good position to uh, learn from many people who do work for the federal government last year. And uh, it resulted in this book that is available online through the IBM Center for the Business of Government. And uh, it is here in hard copy. And so I'm trying not to repeat what was in there, but I will go over the highlights. And then if you have questions and answers uh, later, we'll do that. Uh, the outline for my discussion has four uh, sections. Part of the problem, I think, we were caught uh, unawares when social media really grabbed the uh, public because uh, it is a disruptive medium. It's very different from anything that we had been experiencing before. So I will give you some examples from the public sector, but there are so many others in the private sector that I can also address. And uh, we'll look at some challenges and solutions, more challenges than solutions, and some examples of tools and services. We've all seen definitions, and there, you know there are so many that you can't really decide on one definition. But what I want to point out are the colored terms on here. When we talk about social media, we're talking about a uh, a medium that allows us to act, and those are action verbs that will pop up. So when somebody's using social media, it's for enabling or for influencing or for sharing or publishing or conversing. So uh, there has to be a reason to use the social media tools that you determine you are going to use for your agency. There are some statistics and uh, virtual worlds I have on the top because there are about 1 billion registered users. There are actually this year supposed to be about 500 different types of virtual worlds. So although you may have heard of Second Life and uh, World of Warcraft, uh, there are many others that are out there as well. Uh, Facebook, of course, we know about because of the movies and Man of the Year. And uh, if it were a country, it would be the world's third largest country. There are so many users of Facebook right now. YouTube, uh, Twitter, MySpace, LinkedIn, we're all familiar with those. Uh, just recently, LinkedIn uh, had an IPO. And how many purchased stock? Was anybody <laughs> able to do that? Uh, that uh, Pre presents, I think, potential challenges in the fact that many of these uh, many of these social media tools are going to be more in the hands of the investors, which might have a lot to do with how they're going to morph into the future. And those terms of service agreements that you've so carefully uh, crafted uh, may have to be uh, recrafted. So there has to be some uh, eye out for changes that will continually occur. This came from last year. When I first received the grant to do this study, I um, employed two students who are researchers at uh, San Jose State University, where I work. And we thought this was going to be easy. It was going to be a simple, oh, wow, social media is fun. Let's see how the federal government is using it. And we'll tie that in with records management and see what they're doing. And uh, I thought that was the purpose. So my students went out, and they did searches on the web, and they scoured uh, publications, uh, newspaper articles, whatever they could find to see what was happening last July. And this is what they found at the time. Most of the agencies were using social media for syndication, aggregation, RSS feeds. So that's pretty easy, because you've got something content that was somewhere else, and you're trying to send it out. 
Uh, and then microblogs, we were trying to tweet uh, from the conference today. And uh, Twitter is, of course, the most uh, familiar to us, along with Yammer, I'm sure many of you know. Uh, social networking comes in next in blogs. Now you could see as we go on down the line, there are so many different types of tools to choose from and each one has a purpose. And you must understand what your goals are in order to select the one that would be most useful. This brings us to some examples from the public sector. I removed my private sector examples for you, and I wanted to start with the state government because uh, I taught web design uh, long before social media, and so I have a special affinity with web designers, and I think you need to avail yourself of their expertise because they do understand good organization for content. And uh, those sites like the state government who use their website as a hub for their social media activities provide that kind of organization eventually for harvesting uh, some of the information from the social media sites from at least this one central area. Also for directing uh, their customers, clients, patrons, uh, the public out to the other services that are available and then hopefully on each of those social media sites sending them back again. The RSS feeds also are sent out by the Department of State and you could see that uh, it's a way of categorizing information uh, to make it easier for the public to digest, which is why this is so well used and so often used. The Smithsonian, I had to put this in here. I had the USGS in before. Anybody here work for the United States Geological Survey? That's an amazing Twitter example, and I wish I had you up here to explain how people who are experiencing the first tremors of earthquakes can actually tweet and then have that incorporated with scientific data and then plot it on a map and fit out again. Talk about records bringing in new information mashing it up with information that you're gathering from somewhere else scientifically, and then sending it out as new records to the public. There's a lot that's going on there, and it's for a very good reason. We're talking emergency management, which is essential to your core. Uh, Smithsonian, I put on there because I watch Bones. Anybody watch Bones, the mystery? <laughs> and then there was a, a tweet in there about the Jeffersonian, the evil twin of the Smithsonian that I could just not miss. So that's why that's up there. And you can see that the Smithsonian is reaching out, right? If there's somebody like me who knows what the Jeffersonian is, and that's really a lot of fun, uh, I might also want to go visit the Smithsonian when I'm in town. I can't imagine how many people are wandering around looking for the other, though. <laughs> now, I have this on here, and I haven't gone for an update lately, so does anybody work for the National Archives Recovery Team? In the audience, I was uh, excited about this last year because what they were doing, we were working on a project with my students about lost history, uh, stolen items, uh, misplaced items, and trying to get them back for state and federal government. And the recovery team started their Facebook page. And what was very uh, interesting about this is they it's never a standalone. Your social media has to be part of your big initiative. And they were going off to Gettysburg the time I was talking to them, and they were taking a laptop with them. And they were signing up people for their Facebook site while they were on site actually talking to people face to face. And uh, the idea was that they were trying to encourage collectors to report anything that they think might have been suspicious, something that they could investigate, which again was right along with their core mission. Uh, AOTIS, the National Archives, uh, your archivist, Ferio, is doing a tremendous job of bringing the National Archives into the 21st century. His blog is uh, very interesting in itself, but it's not really interactive, is it? Do you ever go there? Do you talk to him? Uh, he's, he's talking to us, but it's still important because uh, this right here, do you see Michael Jackson on the screen? Don't you love him? And I did not know, and this is the purpose of this, it's teaching us. It's a patent. He actually had a patent in order to bend like that and not fall over. Did you know that? 
There's special shoes and a special thing built in the floor. If I had it now, I wouldn't trip on my way back. And you lock right in, and then you lean. And there were uh, ankle straps or, or braces, and so that's how he could lean so far forward and back. And what I learned from the patent office is he had many, and Motown was a trademark too. He, very good business. I mean, an entertainer, yes, but very good business sense as well. And so uh, that's what we're learning from something like the blog. It's teaching us in perfect uh, example of their core mission. This is the White House blog, and I included this first because I am so thrilled about what happened with the capture, or the killing, I should say, of the uh, uh, Osama bin Laden. But I also have it here because the president was using a video. That video is on YouTube, and, and you know the federal government also uses uh, VMO, and he also has that on the White House blog, and he also has, or whoever created the page has a script, and the script is elsewhere. So as I'm looking at that page, that page, we can capture that as a complete record, but it is also made up of objects that are in other places as well. And so that's what you need to consider too. Where are all the other places where these objects are? Uh, and uh, as I mentioned, one place is the White House blog, but another place is something like YouTube. Uh, just incidentally, I had students working on uh, group projects, virtual time capsules, what do you want the world to remember in 50 years? And one of my teams did 9-11. What they wanted to do was, from a respectful way, talk about all the issues that surrounded it, including the Patriot Act and the way we change the way we travel and everything else. And they were about ready to turn in this terrific wiki video uh, podcast project and uh, the president came on the tube and they had to go back to the drawing board in order to finish their project because they now had what they considered was a very fitting end to the 10-year anniversary. Uh, Flickr and crowdsourcing in the LLC, I'm sure you've seen that before and it is not a huge example in this one instance because what I'm talking about here is 20-some pictures that they did not know uh, what the topic was, where the location was, and uh, they have so many pictures that they've got to process that what they did was throw that out there for crowdsourcing. Does anybody know what that is? And within a few days, they found out they're in France. And uh, so they knew exactly the location, and it was from the public looking at the pictures. So uh, what that has to do with records management there, of course, is that you have images somewhere. I'm sure they're, they're uh, recorded as records, but you have metadata that go along with your images, and some of the metadata they did not know. They did not know the location, for example. So what they were doing at that point is bringing in from the public new metadata, which should be appended to the record. So there you have to consider some of the things that uh, the public are saying, comments you don't have to worry about, but there are some times when you want to capture that. I mean, that's the purpose of it. That's why it was out there. So uh, there is new information there that is important. Uh, this one was probably the most uh, uh, exciting to me, use of a blog with a widget. Uh, and it was very short. Uh, it was the uh, peanut butter scare, remember that, in 2009? I don't think this blog and the widget were uh, purposely up for more than a month. And they had thousands of visitors to the site, and it basically was telling the public oh, what they had to be aware of because of the salmonella peanut butter uh, recall. And uh, the widget part of it, Although you had a blog from the CDC saying this is what to look out for, you know not everybody's going there. So the widget was something that everybody who had website could put onto their own website. And so the picture down here of the announcements coming through was really from an LA uh, fire department website. And so they had something like 5,000 different sites bringing information in from their site alone because of the widget. And uh, when this was closed, what interests me was a comment at the end by somebody who posted and said, I hope somebody is keeping a record of this. 
This was so effective. <laughs> and I don't know, anybody here from the CDC? <laughs> Did you keep a record of this? <laughs> uh, it, because it is an excellent example for uh, one thing that you need to remember, nothing has to last forever, right? At least not out in the public. It served its purpose. Maybe we want to keep it now for archival value or to teach someone a good example. I save exemplars for my students too. But uh, it does not have to remain active, so it was closed. Uh, this here is Google. Google uh, Gmail, we use it at school, San Jose State University. I was just telling some of the gentlemen here that uh, it's really wonderful because it comes on my iPhone, my iPad, my regular computer, my other laptop. I feed it into my Outlook. Isn't that wonderful? And then if I remember to remove something I don't want anymore from all those places, I learned from our IT people that if I just hit this special little plus sign, everything I've ever done since it started is there. They're never going to get rid of anything. So there goes my wonderful uh, destruction <laughs> method, right? I, I've just gone through all of that, and nope, uh, that's their policy. They're keeping it. So you need to really be aware of all of those things that sometimes we only find by accident. Challenges and solutions, as I mentioned, um, social media is different because there aren't any standards because there are so many different types. No corporate controls, uh, rapid pace of change, uh, we are worried about being on YouTube, aren't we? Because once that goes out there, it's going to be there forever. Somebody's going to see it if we really didn't like it or not, doesn't matter. Uh, content and activity oriented, it's not just watching anymore, it's actually doing things like liking things that I'll talk about in a little while. Uh, this is not a, a dish, uh, diss against uh, Iron Mountain. Uh, it was just up there because that clip from a newspaper fit there. So if anybody's here from Iron Mountain, I'm not out to get you. Uh, I wanted to show uh, different things that are happening, like a wonderfully uh, successful flip video camera that is no longer being produced because of our wonderfully successful iPhones and Blackberries that take pictures and we don't need the flip phone. And yet that was very successful. Uh, there are um, other things that you're going to have to download like Google did a tried video for a while and it didn't work. I mean there are initiatives that are out there that you might get excited about, start posting things to and then find out they're disappearing and you have to understand and have a backup plan for what that will be. And that reminds me also, what is their backup strategy? You know, your disaster recovery business continuity, do you need what's out there? Uh, get institutional buy-in. You have that. I don't need to say any more. What I wanted to do was give you an example of what the uh, financial sector is doing. Uh, I heard uh, our speakers this morning talking about more direction, not just what you should do, but how you should do it. Uh, FINRA is the financial regulatory um, agency authority. Uh, and what they do is uh, oversee uh, all of the people that are involved in uh, financial uh, dealings as far as brokers uh, giving recommendations. And uh, they know that if you're a broker, you're in a competitive field and you've got to talk to your public and they're all using social media, right? So to say you can't use it is not a good thing for business. So they have to say you can use it. All right, it is a communication, a form of communication. How do you control it? Well, they're providing a little more guidance. I have quite a bit on this elsewhere, but I just want to bring out the highlights. Some of the very practical things they're saying, like uh, you have to adopt your policies and procedures to protect your investors. Sometimes I get questions about what does that do to you as an agency? Well, you know, you have to protect yourself too, but you should be all about customer service and thinking about your investors and your public in your case. Uh, retention and supervision, uh, they have to, by law, capture and retain social media content as required by specific guidelines. That's, I think, what you need to know more specifically, right? What are you supposed to do? Not just you're responsible. That was one of the things when I, I start talking to people last year I heard. The user is responsible. Well, that's good. But what does the user need to know in order to be protected? Because that comes from top down. And as we protect our uh, public, we have to protect our workers as well. Uh, and they also uh, divide things into static and interactive content. And if you've got a Facebook profile, you upload that profile, that's static, right? So somebody could pre-approve that for your agency. 
But if there's conversation going on actively, then you have to capture that and monitor it as it's happening and afterward, uh, if it does make a record, because you can't control what's happening in real time. As I think you saw by the uh, Secret Service Twitter, did you see that tweet? Wasn't that cute? Uh, somebody thought he was on his personal account. And what he did was tweet, I am uh, expected to monitor a um, segment on Fox News, and I am so sick of the bloviating. And, <laughs> and he no longer has privileges on the official Twitter account. That's <laughs> All right, accidents happen. Have to be careful. There you go with your training and awareness. Uh, third party posts, not responsible unless you endorse it, but be careful. If you know how people send you something and say, do you like it? <laughs> and if you say like it, you're endorsing it. In the financial services sector, that's like giving a recommendation on a buy for a stock or something. And if that doesn't suit everybody that's out there, they have a suitability clause, then you're in big trouble. So you have to be very careful with what you retweet, what you like, what you endorse. Uh, so all I wanted to mention here is that updating the LinkedIn profile, uh, that's something that needs to be considered. Email within LinkedIn or any other social networking is another form of email. You've got to figure out how to capture it in your email system. Um, you would archive it, you would post review it. Twitter, favorites, that's an endorsement, block it if you can. Uh, what I'm thinking as far as records management and all those schedules that you have is create your own crosswalk. This is only an example of uh, some of the things that I took, but a tweet or a retweet is like a public appearance, just like being here. All right, how do you handle those? Uh, maybe something like an endorsement, maybe something just like your electronic forum. Try to tie what's occurring in social media back to your regular retention schedule. Don't think you need to start making any new uh, authorities for yourself until you go through this. Uh, you'll notice that a lot of this can be correspondence. Some of it could be blogging. Uh, some of it can be information gathering. How do you handle your regular surveys? Do a crosswalk for your agency. Examples of tools and services, we all know you've got terms of service agreement, but make sure somebody's monitoring to see how they're changing. Uh, don't be afraid to try on your own privately things and then bring them into the workplace through recommendations, maybe needing to go to another tool, but I use Backupify to back up all of my tweets in Facebook and Google Calendar and everything else, such as the personal thing I do, so you can see how it works. Uh, but there are commercial uh, tools available like uh, Socialware Sync here, uh, which is uh, amazing working with the financial industry, would have ideas for you as well. Uh, but uh, Arcovi is a, a direct competitor of that product, and uh, they are also targeting the financial sector. Notice that they're using uh, LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, RSS feeds, so not all social media, but the most often used that I mentioned earlier. Uh, cloud preservation, uh, there are ways to archive your uh, social media in the, the cloud. What they're trying to do is capture all of that, aggregate it, and then put it in a repository for you. Uh, be very careful with the cloud preservation as you do with anything else. Make sure you understand what's going to happen if that cloud just kind of disappears one sunny day. Uh, and uh, yeah, you never know. <laughs> And also find out if they're backing up. Uh, if that's your only copy of something, what do they do in case of disaster recovery? What are they going to do for you? Uh, some agencies are using uh, Archivit in order to archive, again, all of those social media I mentioned, the most often used ones. Uh, I talked to somebody from, uh, I'm trying to think, from uh, an agency in New York, not a federal agency. They were having a little bit of trouble with it, but they were getting a lot of assistance from Archivit because it is a tool uh, that you could get from the Internet Archives there and they're being very helpful with them. Uh, this here I was mostly intrigued with because they're doing all those tweets for the Library of Congress. Is, are you excited about that? Everything that you tweet is going to be safe forever. And uh, somebody asked me last year, what does that have to do with our retention destruction schedule? You know, I, here I am working so hard trying to figure out how long this tweet lives. And they've got it anyway. And should I have to figure out how long it lives and actually find a tool and save it when they've got it anyway? 
And the answers I was getting was, yes, you've got to figure out how long it lives, and yes, you've got to uh, take care of it yourself, because what you can actually do is dispose of it according to your retention schedule, and then if somebody is actually looking for it for a FOIA, you don't have to produce it because you followed your own schedule and you were doing it properly. So uh, it does make sense. A lot of these things we look at and think, what? Uh, th there really is a reason for it. Um, this company, Signant, out of Burlington, Massachusetts, has a content supply chain management approach. Uh, notice how they will bring in from different social media, package it all together, and then deliver to the client a package. And the package can be delivered all at once or into different categories, uh, which can make it very useful. And so to summarize, I'm thinking the best thing we need to do is just analyze the impact of social media on records managers, but back up. First, don't even use it unless you know why. I, I use a lot of this because I teach students this and we have to do this and we're all online. And so I may use my Twitter for three months because I'm teaching a class. And then I may say, I really don't have anything to say. I'm not going to use it. Why bother? I have better things to do with my life. And you will at work as well. So figure out what you need to use and why you need to use it. And if you do, then figure out what it's going to do with your records management before you initiate that social media initiative. Uh, develop that crosswalk between your existing record schedule and between the records that you believe reside in your social media networking sites. Identify the tools that can be used to capture and manage those records using uh, social media tools that are becoming increasingly available. And uh, that's it. Thank you. Uh, Charlie Barth, the Director of Records for the Navy. Good morning, records people. <laughs> My peeps, I feel so, so comfortable here. Um, as Aria mentioned, I am uh, the Director of Records for the Department of the Navy, and uh, very happy to be here. Ray Rayco is always a great pleasure of mine, and again, to be surrounded with people who are going through the same problems and issues that I am is huge. Um, show of hands, who has a Facebook account? Okay, good. Arian's looking for some new Facebook friends, so make sure... <laughs> Um, I, I'm convinced that Paul Wester chose me to lead this group because I uh, mentioned to him that I gave up Facebook for Lent. And, <laughs> and, and he figured, well, boy, he must be a heavy social media user if he's giving it up for Lent. So we want you to lead this subgroup. So that, that's kind of my, my journey here. And um, so here's what we're going to talk about today. Real quickly, uh, go through some slides. Um, social media registration usage within DOD, Department of Defense, for those of you who are not familiar with that acronym. Um, there is going to be kind of a DOD flavor to my brief, obviously, as a Department of Defense employee. But we're really going to go into this Federal Records Council subgroup and what we did to kind of look at it from a records management standpoint and, and keep the focus there. All right. Isn't this a beautiful slide? I love this slide. The world of social media. Um, some of these have already been referenced, but you know, the, the Arab Spring. Um, social media used to rally the opposition and, and topple uh, dictatorships. Uh, the death of Osama bin Laden. I mean, this guy, the really virtual, is probably the most uh, popular guy in the Twitterverse right now. As the events were happening, he's you know, tweeting real time. Um, and then, of course, uh, what happened in Japan uh, in the, the Fukushima disaster, social media used to find missing persons and solicit donations. The, the use of social media has expanded so far beyond liking and poking and friending and, and tweeting. And so, you know, these are just, you know, real world current examples of that. So why should we care? Um, you know, that first question is something you all should be asking yourselves. Is social media content an agency record? You don't have to answer that now. Um, but I think it, it's clear, especially some of the things that Pat laid out, um, and some of the things I've seen since I've really been focusing on social media, the answer is certainly yes. There are some instances, there are some circumstances where what your agencies are doing with social media would be uh, deemed an official record. Um, the, the social media impact, using it for policy making and strategic planning, 
Um, I don't know if any of you caught this in the Washington Post last week, but there was an article, something the Navy's doing, go Navy. Um, and, and I'll butcher this acronym. Um, it's the MMOWGLI exercise, which stands for the Navy Massive Multiplayer Online War Game Leveraging the Internet. Um, <laughs> did any of you read this? Oh, thank you, one person, great. All right, two people. Um, the, the Office of Naval Research is going to use Twitter and Facebook to put out wargaming scenarios, and anyone can register. Any of you here can register for this. And in 140 characters or less, describe what you would do in this wargaming scenario. And then people can vote in Twitter and rank and stack all of the solutions that come out, and the top five or 10 are then going to get moved over to Facebook for additional vetting and additional ideas, and they're, they're going to take the piracy situation off the Somalia coast, I think, is the initial uh, thing here. So if any of you ever want to play Warfighter or Navy SEAL, um, now, now's your opportunity. You can you know, register for this, and, and once that first you know, project comes out on Twitter, you can start putting your ideas in there. And, and this will be collected, this will be analyzed, and could lead to new Navy warfighting policy, new Navy piracy policy. So that's, you know, again, real world use of uh, social media tools here. All right, top four social media tools. As a subgroup, we focused on these four groupings only. Uh, there are many more, uh, and of course the big tools there, social networks, Facebook, and LinkedIn was just mentioned. Do you believe that? Four billion dollars raised in their IPO. I'm still trying to figure out the value of LinkedIn, but obviously there's a bunch of people out there who think it is valuable and dumped four billion dollars in, into the company. Um, Twitter for microblog, uh, YouTube obviously is the king of the video, and then blogs, are, there's many uh, examples there. All right, so one of the first things we did is look at, okay, how is DOD handling social media? And we actually have a registration of social media sites, a formal official uh, process to make your sites formal and official. And this site is the home page, and you can see uh, highlighted there in the red, hopefully you can see that in the back of the room, those are the four services, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, and what site you go to to register your sites. So here's the Navy site that we got to from the DOD site. Um, and those are major Navy commands there on the right-hand side. And if they're, the little icon there is highlighted, that means yes, indeed, they have a Facebook site or a Twitter site or a YouTube site. And this is how we track social media usage and registering within the Navy. Okay, so out of curiosity, what is out there? And this is the Navy statistics. Um, now again, it's 710, but these are the, no kidding, we went through the process, register, these are official social media sites. Look at the percentages there. Facebook is certainly king at, at 61%. Um, Twitter, you know, second. And then YouTube, Flickr, uh, the, the photo site, and, and blogs. Marine Corps. I noticed Marine Corps is in the house. Here's the Marine Corps numbers. Very similar percentages. Facebook, far and away, uh, the most utilized as a, an official platform. Army. Army's in the house. And I notice you're sitting next to Navy. <laughs> so I guess sometimes we can get along. <laughs> ah, very good. Um, Ar Army by far has the most official registered sites with uh, probably approaching 1,600 by now. Again, similar percentages. And last but not least, the Air Force. Again, similar numbers, similar percentages with, with Facebook and, and Twitter being the big two there. We next try to look at, okay, is anyone compiling metrics in, in the Navy for social media and really tracking what's going on, usage, et cetera? And the answer was yes. Our, our public affairs office, PAO office, which is also called CHINFO, um, they submit weekly metrics. So we got signed up on their mailing list and they're streaming uh, real-time metrics to us. You can see some of the trending topics up there. No big surprise, right? Japan, Libya, Osama bin Laden, Navy SEALs. Um, we we're very proud that Navy SEALs were the third most talked about topic worldwide nationally shortly after this uh, occurred. Um, 
So you can see uh, a lot of the information there. Uh, at the bottom there, again, hopefully you can see the, the Twitter and Facebook. To the far right, um, over 1,000 new followers from the previous week on Twitter just on those five sites. And for Facebook, over 3,000 new fans from the previous week just from those four sites. So a lot of interest in what the Navy's doing uh, on social media. OK, Federal Records Council, that's already been previously explained by Paul. Uh, I am a member of that council, 35 cabinet level executive agencies led by Paul. Um, they came up with three major subgroups in fiscal year 11 that they wanted to focus on. You can see the three there, uh, an email group led by Susan Sullivan of NARA, the Web 2.0 social media group led by me, and then the ERA rollout led by Mike Carlson. Why does the FRC think social media is important? Um, that first quote there really speaks volumes, and that's from the NARA Web 2.0 white paper that came out in 2010. Um, there is a huge risk of losing truly valuable materials that have been placed on social media platforms that aren't anywhere else. It is original content. It is only on that social media platform. Um, you know, other agencies have tried to use social media, but due to lack of experience with the technology and how the heck would I even save these records anyways, a lot of them just scrap them. Um, show of hands, how many agencies, how many of your agencies block you from actually going to social media sites? Yeah, God, almost half. So really hard to track your social media usage as a records manager if you can't even get to the sites, right? Um, Okay, so the, the subgroup itself, these are all the participating agencies in the subgroup that we form, Department of Navy, uh, EPA, Department of Justice, uh, had some participation from Army as well, uh, Department of State, Export, Import, Bank of the United States. Is anyone here from EBIS? I was gonna give them a shout out because they actually hosted our meetings for us, so thank you uh, to them. Uh, and then of course, uh, Department of Education and National Archives. We met every two weeks for about four months to come up with uh, some deliverables. And speaking of the deliverables, these were the big three that the subgroup uh, has provided. A white paper uh, that's going to be going to the archivist that lays out in detail every excruciating decision we made as a subgroup, meeting minutes. Um, you know, it's a very robust, detailed paper uh, that the archivist can have to see everything that the subgroup did. Uh, the executive brief. Um, uh, very similar to what you're receiving right now. We'll also be going uh, to the archivist, and then most importantly, the GRS, a, a draft general records schedule on social media records and, and how we felt as a group would be the best way to manage them. Challenges of social media records. Um, this is kind of a no-brainer. You know, the volume of the records is growing exponentially. Um, it, it's very difficult to get our hands on it now. It's only going to get worse. Uh, terms of service has been mentioned many times. I'm going to talk about it the, the rest of my brief here and, and how we negotiate with Facebook and Twitter. And oh, by the way, Facebook, we would like you to destroy things after X amount of time. Um, I, I'm not sure if any federal agency has had good luck with that yet. We're attempting to do the same uh, within our office. And then you have the internal versus external as well. Some of us utilize internally hosted social media platforms, meaning your agency uh, owns the boxes, owns the servers, owns the social media platform, and you're utilizing as, those as well. We want the GRS to make sure it applies to those internals. Okay, what do we uh, accomplish? Um, quite a bit, actually. Um, I, I kind of had a methodology in mind on what I wanted the subgroup to focus on, and it was kind of a stepped approach here. Number one, research the so social media sites within your agency. Um, what was out there? Many of us weren't even aware, self-included, what was within our own agency when it came to social media. Um, when Matt and I began looking at you know, Navy, we're like, holy cow, it, it's, it's more pervasive than we even thought. And so I, I would ask each of you to do that if you haven't already. Find out what's already existing within your agency. Uh, secondly, determine if there is a formal registration process for your agency. I brought up that DOD site and Navy site. Does your public affairs office have a formal process to make sure you're registered? That's very important. Um, we then experimented, actually experimented, with capturing data as records um, from, uh, in using various methods. We also looked at some of the commercial technology to safeguard records. 
And then lastly, the, the three deliverables uh, that were handed over. Um, I've also had the ability to brief this to the Joint Staff and the Combatant Commands, that's what the, the, the COCOM stands for there, um, a FOIA audience, and also an ITCIO audience. So this has got broad interest beyond just the records management community. Okay, and, and this, this is a real ugly slide that looks real blurry, so my apologies. But these are all of the, what I'll call, headquarters sites for the participating agencies. The left-hand side there, you see the Department of Navy, EPA, State, Department of Education, Export Import, and Department of Justice. Each one of us had a headquarters Facebook site, headquarters Twitter site, a headquarters YouTube site, and a blog site. The Navy is split up into three categories because we did a headquarters site, a major command site, and then a ship site. Almost all of our ship platforms, especially the aircraft carries, they have their own Facebook and Twitter sites. They have their own blog sites, which is great for the family back home. Uh, another uh, method of communicating or getting information back from the ship to make sure uh, their, their loved ones are, are safe and doing well. Okay, so what were some of the options we looked at? And, and we were very generic here. Some of these may seem uh, kind of uh, ar archaic, but we copy and pasted content from Facebook, from Twitter, um, from the blogs, put into a Word document, put into a PDFA document. If we had RMAs, we put them into an RMA, filled out some metadata fields. Um, we also did that just putting it on ShareDrive or other non-RMA storage uh, devices. Uh, RSS, you've heard that already, the really simple syndication and using an RSS aggregator like Google Reader to kind of collect. I want blog updates here, Twitter updates here, Facebook updates here, put into this aggregator and put into a nice neat package for me. Um, utilizing that same RSS feed into an email account and then save that record into a records management application. And then lastly, the commercial options. Um, and there's a lot of those uh, out there right now. We'll talk about a couple of them here. And so here are the results, the, the complete results, the pros, cons of each of those five options we laid out in this beautiful looking spreadsheet that again, you probably can't read. <laughs> Sorry about that, that was on purpose. Um, but no, we, uh, <laughs> not a lot of kind comments in there. Because um, as you can imagine, I mean, who has the resources and the staff to mine all of your agency social media sites? collect content, save content. Um, I mean, it, it's beyond a full-time position for multiple, multiple people, and, and you're never going to capture it all. Um, but this is in the white paper uh, that is going to the archivist, and I believe will be released to the greater public at some point in time, so you will be able to see how the agencies experimented, what they liked, what they didn't like. All right, so the commercial options. Um, these are some that we as a group experimented with. Uh, I, I must be clear, as a federal employee, I'm not allowed to endorse any of these. Um, but many of these, I, I think, show great promise. Um, you know, Backupify was mentioned. Uh, the Coast Guard is utilizing Backupify. Um, I think these tools, and again, it, it's a growing industry. Many more are becoming available. They're realizing there's a market here. Uh, of being able to safeguard your social media content uh, for a company or business or a federal agency. All right, general record schedule. I hope everyone in here knows what a GRS is, so no need to, to really go uh, over that, but that was the, the crux of what this subgroup was about, coming up with a draft GRS that hopefully uh, could be utilized by each of you. The challenges we had when drafting this GRS were many. A, a few are just highlighted here. Um, are these records permanent or temporary? Is there both potentially within your social media platforms? And, and what's the best way of organizing the content in the GRS? Do you do a tool-specific schedule? Facebook records do this. Twitter records do this. YouTube videos do this. Do you do an activity-specific schedule? Um, comments, here's what you do. Posts, here's what you do. Videos, here's what you do. Blogs, here's what you do. Um, that was another thing we looked at. Is it platform specific? We talked about internal, meaning government owned, versus external. The Facebooks, the Twitters, etc. 
And then, or is it content specific? Administrative records do this, program records, public affair records. Um, we experimented with all four of these, and each time we thought we were getting close, um, we would change our mind and head in a different direction. But those are all ways that you could potentially organize your social media records, and, and there's many more. And then, and lastly, you know, for the GRS itself, is this important enough, big enough to be a new GRS, in this case, GRS 28, or do we fold it into an already existing GRS, say like GRS 20, which is the electronic records GRS? Um, you know, that's a decision for NARA and the archivist to make, but uh, you know, we could see it going either way. Okay, so drum roll please. Um, here is, you know, snippets of the actual verbiage in the draft GRS. Um, okay, yeah, that's big enough, you can read that. The, the internal versus external is huge. That's why we spell out the federal agency servers or third-party platforms. In terms of service, we have some recommended verbiage in there. Plus, we do include a template uh, that came from GSA and the Federal Web Council, uh, a, a terms of service template that each of you can have as you're trying to negotiate records management you know, verbiage into these social media uh, companies. Again, some additional verbiage here. Um, we did mention cloud computing platforms. We thought that was important. But basically, the schedule draws no distinction between the content stored on the cloud or other platform. And also, we, the schedule would apply to social media records of any format posted to any platform. OK, so here's the slide you've all been waiting for. If, if you like this, you can come up and congratulate me and the team you know, at the break. If, if you don't like this, Arian kind of thought this was a great idea, so you can... can That's twice now. You, you, can throw, you, can, you can throw your anger at Nara. Um, but, but we experimented with the time frames, and I think we had everything you know, from you know, 12 months or three months all the way up to five years, 10 years. We experimented with so many, and we just thought, you know what? Let, let's just put this, this three-year in here. And you can see we, we've grouped into social media records, a very general uh, you know, verbiage there. But you can see we try to include you know, platform-specific, uh, topic-specific, and then also the social media management and operations records. What's key to note here, and it's bolded there at the end, um, under the social media records, when applicable, apply an approved agency schedule. OK, so what does that mean? Instead of, okay, well, hey, we're just saving all social media records for three years and then we're going to destroy, you got to go back to your own schedules. And for example, your agency head, many times their correspondence is permanent. And let's say your agency head has his own Twitter site or your agency head has his own blog or Facebook page. Is the content from that potentially permanent? I could argue yes. Some of you could probably argue no. But it's something to think about. Original content, it's correspondence. Um, I, I think of the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Admiral Mullen. He's got a great blog. He's got a great Twitter site. And again, he's not putting classified information out there, obviously. But as he travels the world and meets with foreign dignitaries and other foreign uh, military heads, he's putting a lot of that information out there. And it's probably the only place where some of that, you know, in, in his perspective, sometimes his opinions. Uh, sometimes his praise is, is he's visiting some of the war fighters around the world. Um, my guess is NAR would probably like to hang on to some, some content like that, so keep that in mind. Okay, uh, like any other good GRS, we have a, a glossary section uh, defining things like the internal, external sites and cloud computing as well. Um, we wanted to make sure you know, that we put in uh, you know, kind of a yard marker for cloud computing in the schedule. So moving forward, where, where are we at as a subgroup? We have officially disbanded, which is great news because now we get to go back to our day jobs. Um, and we have sent the th three deliverables just this week to Paul Wester and the Federal Records Council. We'll be formally briefing them in June. And I, I believe there's a host of folks that Paul wants us to get with, the Federal CIO Council, the Federal Web Managers Council, obviously the archivist himself. Um, so not sure how quickly this will be distributed to all of you, our deliverables. Uh, not sure how quickly uh, this may end up in a GRS, but the, the process is more than underway. 
uh, and it, the ball is now in NARA's court with all of our deliverables. Some, some quick additional findings. Uh, Department of Justice, are you here? Someone said yes. Don't be shy. Oh, hi. Um, Department of Justice has an approved schedule for social media records. Uh, I believe it's limited to public affairs office records only, um, but that is something you all can utilize now, and I believe they were the first uh, federal agency to get an approved schedule for social media records. Um, and then putting in a plug for Navy, Chimfo has a, an incredible social media handbook. You see the, the web link there. If, if you are looking for some resources to create social media policy within your own agency, you know, you can't go wrong as a starting point with these two. There's really good information in there. Um, you know, needless to say, records management professionals do need to st stay engaged with social media and the developments. Uh, the bottom line is kind of that second bullet. If information is posted by a federal official on a social media site and the content meets the definition of a record, it must be saved and managed as an official record. Kind of sucks to say that out loud, but <laughs> it's the truth, right? <laughs> um, I, I see a lot of familiar faces in the room, and, and if I could just quickly um, ask, are any members of the subgroup here, and if so, could you please stand up? See one there? Please stand up. I, I want to give you a round of applause. These folks worked really hard, and, and they had to put up with a lot of my crap, so uh, I, I wanted to acknowledge them uh, here in this forum. Um, with that, I am done, and, and hopefully gained us back some time. Um, you've got uh, my information here and my staff. Any questions you have beyond this? Yes, sir. <laughs> all the Navy, all the oh, Navy, or all the um, personnel were able to use it. Everybody on the ship, you know, were able to get to their own Facebooks. Really? Yeah, the short answer is yes. The, the longer answer is we've kind of gone through periods of social media is evil, social media is good, social media is evil, social media is good. <laughs> and so uh, there was a time where we were shut out network wide. Nope, you cannot access Facebook because it's just people screwing around and, you know, wasting time. But uh, we, we now have, you know, uh, full access to those. The, the ships, it's a little bit different story because they have bandwidth constraints when they're deployed at sea. Um, so it's not a 24-7, oh, yeah, they can, you know, get to Facebook all the time. But for the most part, yes, we now have relatively full access to social media but sites. That's just amazing. To be, we, we need to make a, a, a business case to uh, let one person uh, access the site. That's wow. Yeah. All right, um, Ari and I believe you're going to run a Q&A yeah. session, so thank you very much for your time. We do have time for... <laughs> we do have time for a few extra questions. Uh, you can address... Please wait for a microphone, and I'll just, we'll just open it up. Unless you're really loud. <laughs> uh, Claire Barrett with the Department of Transportation. I'd be interested to know how your approval process works and whether or not it's run by your records management office or, I'm sorry, this is for the Department of Navy, uh, whether or not it's run by your records management office or whether or not it's your public affairs or how does that work? Because we, that is a question I think a lot of agencies are struggling with is who owns this responsibility for the approval process of whatever the medium is? And I think traditionally it's been public affairs and I'm hearing sort of a shift towards records you know, in two years from now, it'll probably go back to public affairs. <laughs> you know, how did you address that? Yeah, currently it is managed and run by the public affairs office um, with no uh, consideration from the records management team. I mean, we're trying to inject ourselves nicely, um, but it is completely run, the process, the approval process. Um, it's not real strict guidelines. I, I would say there's probably 10 to a dozen that they're saying, okay, if you want to play in the sandbox, we ask that you do these kind of things. Most of them are common sense, you know, professionalism, um, et cetera. But it, it's completely run by a PAO office right now. Um, Patty Stockman, NASA. 
Thanks for the panel. Great, two great sessions, two great uh, talks. But Charlie, specifically to you, I am so excited to see the work that you guys did, and, and I would love to see it sooner rather than later if Paul Wester's in the room. Uh, <laughs> in fact, I just got back from the archives. I had sent over a, a draft retention schedule for what we called information dissemination. Uh, largely information contained on websites, not always social media, but sometimes. And, um, and just got some comments back. It was, just a it was just an informal review I was asking for. I would have loved to have known you guys were doing this and, uh, and have a copy of what you did. But I specifically wanted to ask um, why, your, why the draft GRS is specific to social media content, given that it looked like it was geared um, towards the, the um, function, like public, public affairs sorts of content. And I, didn't, I couldn't read it quickly enough to see the rest of the uh, thrust of the content. But it, just like the, your schedule and, I mean, your disposition instructions concluded with, use existing schedules where applicable. Why did these have to be tied to social media specific? Yeah, that's a good question. And I, I guess the best answer and the shortest answer is we're a subgroup. We all had day jobs. We had a limited amount of time to produce a deliverable. So we wanted to keep the focus as small as possible. Uh, there's, there's many great scholars out there that are defining social media, how it's used in the federal government. We really wanted to keep the focus on, OK, just the records management aspect. And knowing that we couldn't look at the entire social media universe in four, you know, four short months. So we, that was part of our education is what's out there? What is the most popular right now? What do we think will maintain its popularity over time? And so, yeah, it was kind of a bias towards, you know, the Facebook, the Twitters, the YouTubes, and the blogs. But it was just mostly time constraints on, on why we try to keep it compressed to that. Well, I, I think, again, if I'd left the slides up m more than five seconds, you, I think you'll see that the content is pretty generic and broad. Um, I, I don't think you'll be disappointed when you read the full GRS and, and some of the, you know, the implementation aids that we included in the draft. I think it is pretty all-encompassing. Um, so the research was focused on a small part, but, but we, we really think as a group that the, the schedule is broader than you think. I, I think when you guys get a chance to review it, once you know, Paul Wester releases it, and, and again, the key word here is it's a draft. It is a draft. There will be multiple iterations. It, it may get completely butchered before it ends up on, on the archivist's desk for signature, right? It, it may look nothing like that by the time it ends up there. So. Uh, you know, Paul asked us to take a shot at this um, in a very short time frame, and, and we, we think we've, we've got pretty close, and it's certainly better than what we had before we started, which was nothing. So, but welcome your comments, please. And when, when, we, when we do make it available, it will be available on Records Express. So, I mean, that's part of how we'll communicate the availability for, the, the availability and openness of this, these materials for comment, and that's, um, I think that's that was always in the in the uh, the working groups back in the back of their mind was they always knew that there were going to be more collaboration uh, moving forward and before a GRS gets promulgated, NARA goes through its process. So we've always known this was going to be a starting point. And as Charlie just said, you know there was nothing out there to begin with, so any starting point was going to be a good starting point. Again, this is Jessica Brown from DHS. If NARA decides to go with the uh, GRS um, that was implemented, are, uh, are the agencies such as uh, DOJ that have come up with schedules already, are they expected to do away with those schedules or are they just going to adopt um, what's in place, the GRS, as well as what they um, implemented? Well, the, uh, the traditional answer is the GRS is mandatory for federal agencies, but they can apply for exemptions to the GRS through the scheduling to the usual scheduling and appraisal process. So if the proposed dispositions in the GRS do not fit an agency's business case, the traditional scheduling and appraisal process would uh, take precedence for that agency. And I think I got that right. But I'm no longer in the appraisal unit, so don't quote me. <laughs> Dolores Bailey, I'm a consultant. Um, how do, if the records people were not involved in the creation of the websites or the, the, the uh, social media sites, how 
does a records person get at the table? What is the process? I mean, how, how did you, if, if, you, if you say, well, these are, these are records and they need to, the information needs to be captured, how do you start that conversation if they weren't even there when, the, when it was created? I'm being allowed to answer that one. Sure. <laughs> and, and then I'll pass it along. <laughs> what I found last year when I spoke to some people in records management is they were not even aware there were social media teams. I, I think records managers now first have to be recognized as part of an information management team. However you'd like to call it, probably information governance is more broad. But I think it's up to the records managers as well to make friends within the organization to find out what is going on. And it's up to the website uh, team and the social media team to uh, understand that their job can be done more effectively and efficiently if they team up with the records manager. So I think I was at the IRS when I called and asked about a records manager on the social media team and they were not aware there was one. By the time I came down two weeks later, the records manager was on that team. It took her going to her supervisor and saying, do we have a team? Am I on it? And she, she was. I don't know. Is anybody here from the IRS? Uh, but that's what it took. A lot of talking, uh, a lot of understanding each other, and support from your immediate supervisor, whoever that may be, to help you make those inroads as well. And, and just adding on to that, I think the short answer is terms of service agreement. Um, the, the draft that we have, or the template we have in the GRS, I think letter W, talks about records management and has verbiage in there, right now that is the best way, making sure your records management verbiage gets into that terms of service agreement with those social media providers. Okay, we got the hook from backstage because we're standing between you and a break. So we will close this panel now and I'm sure Charlie and Pat will be available during the break if you have questions. So one more round of hands.